Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Pete Whitaker, thank you for joining me tonight. I guess it's morning for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mid mid morning, but yeah, thanks for having mid me morning. on. Cheers. <laughs> All right. So the name of the game is send or spend. The idea is I've got ten questions lined up for you about your climbing career and then also some some climbing trivia some little more personal questions you can skip a question or get any of the trivia questions wrong it doesn't really matter but if we get to the end and you've answered everything you get the right to the adsense money from this video and you can either send it to a charity of your choosing or spend it on a new pair of climbing shoes so are you ready to dive in yeah, yeah i'm ready to dive in crack up Okay, question number one. So I think for myself and a lot of people, the wide boys sort of just appeared fully formed in the real rock film. I want to get a bit into the early years. How did you and Tom first meet? Uh, we first met probably like 15 years ago now. Um, I was 17 and a, a customer at the climbing wall, at the climbing gym locally in Sheffield. And um, Tom was a root setter there. And I guess we just got like chatting, you know, uh, because I like I was a I was a local there. Tom was looking for climbing partners to do like this um funny random challenge, which was to try and break the world record for the most amount of routes climbed in a day. Um, and he couldn't find anybody else to do this challenge with, and he'd asked a bunch of people, and I was the first person that actually said yes to doing this <laughs> to doing this challenge. Pre previously, <laughs> I didn't actually know that he'd been asking other people. And everybody else had said, nah, nah, I'm not too sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but yeah, I guess that's kind of how it how it all started and how we met. And then from there, you know, the, we just realized that climbing together was fun and, you know, had the same motivations and kind of rolled rolled from there, really. Yeah, but it definitely, it didn't start with crack climbing. It just started with, you know, just general climbing out on the grip in the Peak District. That's so perfectly on brand for you, too. <laughs> like that, that fits so well. That's so funny. Uh, for you personally, when was the moment when you looked at rock climbing and thought, like, this is what both like, like, this is what I can do and this is what I want to do? Ooh, um, I don't think I've ever looked at it in that way, probably just because I, I've grown up with it from such a young age. Um, like my parents obviously got me into climbing and being in the hills and walking and scrambling and this sort of stuff. So it's always just been there i've never looked at it as oh let's go and try rock climbing it's more been like that's rock climbing that's just like what i know um <clears throat> and like when when people come into climbing and they're like learning new things and you're sort of teaching people i just i don't remember going through that stage as a <laughs> as a climber because <laughs> i just did it from so young um, yeah and I think, yeah, I think it was it was just like that. And especially with being like a, I guess, like a professional climber now, that has also just been a real gradual process throughout the last 10 years. So it wasn't like, okay, now I'm doing this and now I'm going to switch. And yeah, I, I have some sponsorship deals and I've become a professional climber. Like that didn't happen. It It was like a real gradual process over... 10 years of okay now i've done this oh now this brand is offering me a little bit more now i'm sort of in with this brand and working with them i've got a two-year contract oh the next two-year contract is a little bit better um and and then it's just progressed and you can drop the other things and you can take up more climbing things and that's kind of how it rolled yeah pretty much been nice. very been very <laughs> like it hasn't been like one point at, at anything yeah yeah you never had to like make a call and be like i'm all in i'm a climber it just like you just it became just, a professional climber it was just a gradual real slow gradual process i think yeah yeah okay and obviously you're mostly known for crack climbing but like you kind of touched on before that you had a pretty impressive stretch as a gritstone climber what's one ascent like if you had to pick one climb i guess pre wide boys days that you're most proud of what would that be uh, I think the one that I would look back on is uh, one called Dynamics for Change, which was um, one at Burbage South, and people might have seen it. It's like the one with the big uh, left heel hook and then rocking over. And I think mainly, 
I would say that one because it was something that people had tried previously. Um, I was still quite young at the time. I was like 17. And at the time, it didn't feel like such... It was just like, oh, it's cool to do a first ascent. But now looking back on it, I'm like, hmm, actually, that was... People had tried that. And it it does look a bit weird when you look at it. It's like a totally insane move, to be <laughs> honest. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't really think that. I was just like 17 and psyched and just like, oh, cool, yeah, done, done a cool first ascent, blah, blah, blah. Um, but yeah, looking back on it, it's like, oh, yeah, that was... I think that was kind of... I guess significant in a way for for me um back then yeah yeah number two i Tommy caldwell said in an interview once that modern pro climbers need to spend as much time in front of the computer as they do actually on the wall can you talk about the balance that you have to strike between creating good and new content while also training and climbing hard yeah so for me i can definitely relate to this point because i do spend a lot of time behind the computer and the screen especially with like editing for the the wide boys youtube channel which i do like 50 percent of um but i've never found it so difficult uh, with that balance because i like i enjoy the difference you know i like training hard and going out of doing objectives and climbing and i enjoy that but then i also enjoy having a bit of a sort of contradiction to that and working hard in other ways you know producing content and and that sort of stuff i would i think i would find it boring if all i was doing was going out climbing training every single day and there was no other stimulus in my life i think i think yeah. i need i need something else to like just make it interesting uh, i just get bored doing the same thing like if somebody said you're allowed to go climbing 365 days a year and you could do that and your body could handle it. I would actually say no, because <laughs> I, like, I think I, I just, it gets boring doing the same thing. Like you need to have that break and then come yeah. back to it. You need to have those rest days because the rest days aren't just recovery for your body, but it's recovery for your mind. It's, re it's time to get psyched again and then you can go and do it. So yeah, I like the balance. I'm honestly glad to hear you say that because I like did the whole van trip West Coast US this summer and like at the end of it I was kind of sick of climbing and I was like am I a fraud like yeah. do I not actually <laughs> like this that much yeah so yeah, that yeah. makes me feel better good <laughs> <laughs> and then looking back it seems like one video in particular really helped to kind of kick your guys channel to the next level what was the process behind the silence video like did you go to Norway for that purpose or were you just there and you figured like hey i'll go see if i can jam the hardest route in the world oh you mean the the silence video on the wide boys youtube channel yeah yeah oh that was totally like spur of the moment um video actually like uh yeah i, I went to flatanga and i was just there to do some sport climbing and then i think i just saw some messages on instagram like oh you're going to go and try the crack on silence and i thought oh yeah i'm here why not <laughs> Let's go and give it a go. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I may, may, I may as well film that. That, be, that could may be as well film quite it. funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was, it was, I feel like it was just a, re a real, like, yeah, spur of the moment thing. Just go and do it. I definitely didn't travel there to go and try that. And I didn't have that in mind before going to Flatanger. Like, I was just going for a sport climbing trip, you know. Really? Um, and I certainly wasn't going to go and try silence on a sport climbing <laughs> trip. Because I'm not that level, so. Um, yeah yeah a quick word from today's sponsor squarespace guys i've done a lot of ads with squarespace before in the past and it's honestly because i genuinely think they have a great platform they're the best place to build a website and promote your personal brand if you don't have coding experience and you don't want to have to worry about building stuff from the ground up you can pick from the website theme that you want you can create exclusive content you can view analytics you can link to your socials there's a lot of stuff you can do to make it as easy as possible to build the best website you possibly can. If you want to launch your own personal brand, start an online business, or just offer content online, Squarespace is the best place to do it. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and use the code ascensionism for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain if you want to give the channel a little bit of support.
All right. Uh, speaking, we were talking about Tom earlier. Your guys' relationship, like 15 years now as partners, how have you two managed to maintain that relationship between being really close friends, but also business and climbing partners? What's that been like? Um, I think it's been quite easy, actually. Like, I feel like we've always had one or two big projects per year, which we've always done together. Um, and we've always been kind of focused on those. But aside from that, we also have a lot of our own climbing projects and Tom has his interest in other areas of climbing and I have my interest in other areas of climbing. So I feel like we do those, but then when we come together on the other projects, there's always that like big psych to, to get it done. Um, yeah. And I, I think it's, I think it's quite good not climbing with the same person every single day of the year and mix the partners around a bit because then when you do go and climb with that person like the psych level is high and i think that goes for for, for everybody because you just yeah you kind of in, enjoy it a bit more um yeah and then through the i guess through the more like wise boys and business side of things um tom has a really good like business mindset in a way um and i think for me i mean i'm i'm kind of the main you could say, well, me and somebody else are like the main driving force of the wide boys business. Um, and I've just taken a lot of Tom's or just always like asking questions to Tom and taking a lot of Tom's business knowledge from other things that he's done with Lattice and that kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, kind of seeing him as a, a good, useful source. <laughs> <laughs> So it's been it's been uh, very he's very useful and he always has good ideas and good opinions on things and he's kind of been through the the same business process with lattice and other things as well kind of like a like an older brother that you just ask he makes all the yeah. mistakes and um, <laughs> you, you try not to make them <laughs> yeah you just go off of his experience yeah yeah exactly yeah all right i'm going to screen share with you for a second um can you explain this photo oh yeah <laughs> so that is that's a photo of me uh, in canyonlands with a rope around my neck and then tom uh -huh. found it was like one of those face changing apps like where you do uh, male to female then female to male and uh yeah i think when that happened the the hair has just linked into the rope I'm turned into a female. <laughs> yeah, it's a great photo. He now has it as his um his screensaver on his phone. Is it still his? I th I thought that was just a bit, but like it's still that. I think it's still there. Yeah, and he he always gets like uh sort of comments from from people every now and again, <laughs> like whoa, <laughs> what what is going on here? So, yeah, classic photo. That. Yeah. It's like your Rapunzel, but the the climbing <laughs> rope is your hair. <laughs> very yeah it's quite scary isn't it <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah we'll we'll put that away number four carl tobin once said that it don't gotta be fun to be fun uh between oh, sorry, bridges wide cracks sorry carl tobin he's called i tobin. think so carl tobin carl tobin yeah i hope don't i didn't pronounce that. his name wrong i think he was a, like a like an old-time american climber probably okay yeah uh, between bridges, wide cracks, and rope solos, you seem to have a pretty unique relationship with suffering. What's the farthest you've ever pushed yourself, and what did you take from that experience? Hmm. Um. I know I don't feel like I've pushed myself to. Uh, the thing is, like, I feel like I've always kind of um completed, completed stuff. You, you sort of have that. You can have kind of have hard off with red point pushes and you feel absolutely kind of broken after that. Or you can have the sort of the hard, um, endure, more endurance based, like 24 hour rope solo things like I've done on El Cap and Half Dome and things like that. Um, but they're, they're definitely both slightly different things. So like on the red point front, I remember a route down in Canyonlands, which was called... Um, it was the first ascent called Raging Monkeys, which I did. Um, it's not very well known uh, picture climbing, <laughs> but uh, I remember getting to the top of that and like be barely being able to stand up, and like my tricep was just like 
look like I've been run over by a lawnmower, you know, things like that. And it's like you're not going to be able to do anything after that. And you feel like you've pushed yourself to the absolute limit. And I was very close to kind of falling off. So in that sense of like a hard red point, it feels like you've pushed it to the absolute maximum. Um, but then you have those things like the the free rider rope solo on El Cap, which I did. And that's like a different sort of exhaustion and pushing mm-hmm. yourself. It's kind of like you're just grinding and wearing yourself down. And it's like, oh, well, I can do another pitch. It's more just the fact of, am I going to give up? And you're like, well, no, of course I'm not going to give up. Oh, I'll just keep going. <laughs> but I, ne- I sort of never reached that point of like failing in a way or falling because I was so exhausted. Um, so where still- does that, when you're just like, of course I'm not going to give up, is that like, is that just how you always were? Or is that something you've had to work on? I think that's just how I always have been. Yeah, just not giving up. Um, and like, yeah, w- wanting to wanting to do something, making sure it gets done, trying to do it to the best of your ability. Like all, all those things, like I think, I feel like has always been there in whatever I do, you know, even as far back as like being in school and like just doing schoolwork, you know, like, yeah. oh, like wanted to get it get it done do it to the best you can and then it's done you know and then you can be, you can be happy with that <laughs> so yeah it's, you, it's just it goes with everything I think yeah do you ever have moments like on those big pushes where you're or in some off with where you're just like fuck this I'm gonna become a sport climber like you're just sick of getting cut up and banged up no, I don't think so no 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 <laughs> I, no I, I enjoy it I enjoy it yeah like w- when you're working hard then it feels good I think I think I think that's the thing. Like if it's if you don't feel like you're working hard, then you're like, ah, oh, well, I don't know. Well, it was all right. It was like leisurely, and and that that can be fun as well. But when you want to try hard, you want to try really hard. Uh, and I think that's probably why I got a little bit kind of um, drawn into off with climbing because it gives you that feeling of, you know, like that full body fatigue, full pump, trying really hard. You can still hold on when you're absolutely beasted Uh, and it's more just you only really fail because you give up um yeah 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 fair i'm not sure if that if that question went on a tangent i don't even know where we started there but there we go anyway no i think it was good yeah okay uh so for number five we're on to the rapid fire round i'm gonna ask you a series of increasingly personal questions uh you can skip them but remember there's some some very high stakes here (laughs) yeah. <laughs> okay uh who's a better crack climber you or alex honnold oh probably honnold honnold yeah who would win in a celebrity boxing match you or alex honnold uh me you <laughs> <laughs> all right you've been booked for the celebrity boxing match give us a sample of how you would trash talk him how it um oh, i'm not that much into that how would I go about it? Um, I would... His, uh, oh, his, um, his solo bell cap is invalid. I'll leave it at that, yeah. It's invalid for some reason. Can't think why, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on the subject of fighting, would you rather fight one 10 foot tall Magnus Mitbo or 10 one foot tall Magnus Mitbos? Oof. I don't want to fight Magnus Mitbo. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it would have to be, it'd be the small ones, 10 small, small ones. Small ones? 10 small yeah, ones. Th- yeah. 10 foot tall, like one hit and you're no. done. Yeah, yeah, it's over. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, who do you like collaborating with less, Magnus or Toby Seeger? Collaborating with less. Yeah. Um, I would say mm, oh, both really good though. Um, <laughs> with less, uh, I've done less videos with who have I done less videos with? God, I've probably done the same amount of videos with all of them. Um. Uh, oh, you've got me there. They're both really good. That's the problem. I just have to say one. I'll say Toby. Toby. Yeah, All right. There you go. Yeah. 
who would you rather spend a week in a portal edge with tom or your girlfriend mary okay. a week in portal edge a week in a portal edge yeah yeah it would have to be mari that's easy isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> Um, which would you choose? Never climb again or never talk to Tom again? Never climb or never talk to Tom. Uh, yeah. I would never climb. You would never climb. Wow. Yeah. That's wholesome. All right. We're, we're ending that on a good note. I mean, climbing, right. climbing, you can always find something else, aren't you? Climbing, climbing doesn't, climbing's climbing, isn't it? Whereas good friend is a, it's a proper friend. So. Okay. Question number six. So aside from suffering, you've also done some solos and routes where falling has pretty high consequences. What's your process for risk management and evaluation? And how do you know you're ready to go on a route that could have some pretty serious consequences if you mess up? Um, I think for me, it's, a, yeah, it's like, yeah, definitely like risk management. So I'm always like learning from kind of past experiences in a way so i'm kind of assessing the the objective as it is now or whatever it is assessing those risks and then seeing like learning from past experiences to see you know what what potentially went wrong on those what was good and then what can i apply to the the next the next thing in a way um and i i also kind of see like risk and danger they're like two two separate things so something can be very dangerous but not very risky and something can mm -hmm. be very risky but have less danger um and i think like some of the big uh like free solo things that i've done they obviously have very high danger but i felt like the risk was manageable enough for me to to do them like the risk was quite low even though the danger is very high um, I don't really feel like I'm a very risky person. I don't like taking risk because it feels uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. I like I like to be able to take like manage risk where it feels comfortable, and I've kind of assessed assessed the situation and the, those kind of things because um, I don't like feeling sketched out or being sketchy or yeah. I just I just hate that feeling. Um, yeah. It's not, it's not a good feeling <laughs> no it sucks <laughs> yeah 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 I, um, I think someone like dave mcleod has recommended free soloing as a almost like a training tool for hard track climbing whereas you look at someone like alex honnold and he free solos for the experience where on that spectrum do you think you fall um mm, oh some i would definitely say somewhere in the middle actually Yes, yeah, somewhere in the middle because I've definitely used um a solo climbing for uh like hard trad routes like and it it really helps um being able to get into that sort of like mental um kind of space that you need to be in uh, and helps with you know, being run out and things like that. But also like you know free soloing a a big wall and kind of getting to the top under all your own effort or your own steam. Uh, doing it quickly doing it efficiently like it's a pretty good feeling like <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's, uh, like it's it's pretty cool so um in that way then it it is for the experience as well like when you're climbing well and moving well um yeah it just like pretty good <laughs> it's pretty good so like i think i've definitely used it for both things so i would mm -hmm. i would i would sit somewhere in the middle between those between those two i think yeah. You on at the route. Would we ever see a uh, El Capitan free solo from Pete Whitaker? Oh, from me? No, not a chance. No, <laughs> no, 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 I'm not, no. I'm not going to do that. Absolutely not. No. no. Oh. Sorry. It's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Number seven, gear is obviously super important for climbers. If you could only use one pair of shoes for the rest of your life, what would they be? Um, Like a rock shoe, you mean? Yeah, yeah, one pair of rock climbing shoes. One pair of rock shoes. Uh, at the moment, I've been using uh, the Unparalleled Rise, um, and I just find them really good for like all all round things. You know, I've climbed like Fontaine boulders, and then like big wall trad routes, and yeah, like sport climbing in them. They're just like a, a pretty basic flat shoe, Velcro straps, got a good heel on them, 
if you had to sacrifice one size of cam from a standard rack to never use again, what would you ditch? Uh, gold hand jam. They're they're basically a cam anyway. So. <laughs> I heard Alex Hoddle say he just doesn't carry. I think it's like C threes for him. He just never carries them because he's like, I don't need that shit. Uh, the small the the micros. Or... No, like like th- size threes for him. That's apparently a hand gem, like a black diamond blue three. Oh, a blue, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, is I guess yeah. I mean, those sizes like the the yellow, the blue, the the gray can be quite yellow and blue. It's basically like yellow and blue, isn't it? Really. You and Tom have been massive proponents of the hashtag Crack is Back movement. Why is it important to you that crack climbing remains a part of the rock climbing world? Um, I think that whole like, uh, yeah, crack is back and crack climbing. Uh, for us, we just wanted to bring the enjoyment that we had uh, of crack climbing and bring it into the modern world of crack climbing, which is you know a bit more like in the indoor scene and make people feel inclusive that they can go crack climbing that. You know, when you know how to do it, it's not painful, it's not horrible, um, all these types of things. And it's really enjoyable and it's a really useful tool for when you're going climbing in specific areas and when you're climbing on bigger routes in the mountains and, and these sorts of things. Um, yeah, I think that was that's kind of like uh, my philosophy behind uh, <laughs> behind crack climbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and kind of like, yeah, the whole the whole crack is back thing. So, yeah, yeah. Get, get, Aside that, from that, that whole uh, that whole crack is back thing, that was uh, Tom. Just uh, I can't remember. We were walking to the crag one day, and it was in the beginning of like us starting the the wide boys business. And um, he was like, "Oh, we need some sort of hashtag that we can put at the end of our posts." And he was just he was like, "Oh, let's just let's just use crack is back and see if it catches on." And then, and then that was and that, it did, yeah 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 it totally caught on so aside from adam andra who's impressed you most with their crack climbing technique on the the traditional non-crack climbers oh um i i really like what i don't know him but i like what um connor herson has been doing in the states um mm-hmm. i feel like he's he's like the next generation of climber coming through He's got like amazing sort of sport climbing, comp climbing ability, but he's also mixed that with, you know, like I'm pretty sure he didn't he free the nose at like 14 or something ridiculous. Yeah, it was it was ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. And um and he's climbed like empath on gear and and all these like really cool things. And he he knows how to jam and he knows how to use those techniques, but has the strength of like that modern climber growing up in in, in using indoor gym facilities and i think mm-hmm. i don't know how old how old he is now but maybe he's like 18 19 20 I'm, I'm not sure but i feel like i feel like he is the next generation of that kind of trad climber going to be able to push it um so yeah i'm looking forward to seeing what what he manages to do yeah sorry yeah that's a good shout out mm. okay number nine we're at the trivia round so I've got some, cl- I've tried to keep it, you know, trad crack focused. So, yeah. and also some, just some British climbing trivia in there. So belly full of bad berries, obviously one of the most famous off with climbs in the world on sighted by you. Who has the first ascent? Uh, that is Brad Jackson. Nice. Okay, after a friendly rivalry with the local French climbers, Ben Moon sent this famous route, making it the first 8C in France. I think that was Agincourt. Yep. Correct, yeah. (laughs) Okay, first led by Ron Fawcett, this famous E6 wasn't on-sighted by a British climber until Steve McClure in 2014. Um, I think it was Strawberries. It was Strawberries, yeah. Yeah. I feel like that might get E7 now. I don't know. It's E6, E7, isn't it? I'm not sure where it's settled at. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't be... Like, I've, I've read a bunch about how it, it kept kicking really good climbers off, so I wouldn't be mm. surprised. Yeah. Okay, you've done several collabs with Magnus Mitbo. What is his red point max, and what route was it on? Uh, He has climbed 9B, but it was a... 
it was a it was like that boulder cave into a root uh mm-hmm. the alibaba alibaba cave or alibaba yeah. the root yeah um but i if it's pure sport climbing i don't think he like starting on bolts and not starting a boulder problem i think it's i think it might be 9a plus but i couldn't tell you the route because i think he's done quite a few of them um yeah i didn't even i just had the i think it's got it's like the alley alley hulk sit start extension oh yeah there you go yeah 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 Yeah. we'll we'll say that's close enough (laughs) final part of the trivia i thought based on Again, your brand, I have thrown together a little game called Name That Crack. I'm mm. going to share screen with you again, uh, ignoring the P picture. Um, <laughs> I'm going to show you a picture and we'll see if you know the famous crack route. Oh, that is, um, oh, dear. what's that called? Trench Warfare. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I know you've climbed that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that one. Yeah, of course I do. That one, that's the monster off wits. Yep. Yeah. Oh, skip to the next one. That's Tom on the boulder start of uh, Green Spit. So what would that? What did he call that? Pura Pura. Nice. Yeah. That's Cobra. Cobra Crack. Will Stanhope that one. Uh, that's Hazel on uh, Magic Line. Yeah. Uh, that is Jacopo on... Is that in... Is that in Italy? Yeah. Is it Lapatera Pia? It is. Yeah. Lapatera. Lapa, I, I can never get the name, but. Yeah. Yeah. All right, there we go. That was, I'm impressed yeah. by that. Yeah. Number 10. So the Wide Boys represents a really interesting dichotomy to me where you're kind of combining like old school trad and crack, like the more traditional areas of climbing with recent forms like competition climbing. Where do you see the sport headed in the future, and what do you think of the direction that it's going in? Um, I th- well, hopefully, we're going to see it in like more indoor gyms, um, and the ability for people to kind of practice and learn in that kind of safe environment, in a way, and then being able to take it like outdoors if they want it to, if if they want to, um, and if they don't want to, then you know. I think being able to apply that more modern style bouldering to cracks and that kind of thing is is kind of cool for the indoor scene. Um, but I think for us, yeah, it's all about just like being able to provide education and facilities uh, and, you know, products that are, are nice to jam on, uh, especially yeah, from that point of view in, in Wide Boys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I kind, of, I kind of see it going from there. Ho- hopefully more competitions and international competitions will um start to use cracks and implement cracks and we'll see a bit more than just like hand jamming maybe we'll start to see some other techniques and maybe some foot techniques being used and these sorts of things so i mean that would be cool because um i think sometimes in the comps they they don't set the jams i think one because they know the competitors don't have the experience in it so it might not make a very good like climb or spectacle to the audience if nobody can kind of get up it. Um, and also the second thing is uh, like the protection of the hands and, you know, not bleeding on the holds and stuff. But if you can kind of get rid of those two with good education and good products um, and being able to show people the techniques, then I think there's some really interesting things in crack climbing that could you know that that is actually really fun for the audience to watch so okay that all makes sense yeah (laughs) (laughs) okay we've reached the end pete thank you so much if you have a a favorite charity or cause you really believe in we'll still i'm totally would love to donate the proceeds towards that as a thank you for taking the time to do this yeah that would be awesome yeah i mean i um uh do some i'm a trustee for the alpkit foundation uh so they're a a charity in the uk that um help like people who can't necessarily get into the outdoors and get into climbing um or have disadvantages or from or from like inner cities 
and they help them get into and experience the outdoors and climbing and stuff. So um, I'm a trustee for them and I kind of, yeah, help with the picking of uh, which applications are going to be processed and stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, any donation to them, they do really good things. So that would be cool.